Welcome to High Ridge Church Online. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. The best way for you to get the details you need for every event or ministry is on highridgechurch.com or by downloading the High Ridge app from the App Store or Google Play. You can also connect with us on any of our various social media platforms. If you have never joined us at one of our weekend services, we would love to have you. You can find directions and service times for each of our campuses online at highridgechurch.com. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to speak into your life. Thank you for joining us online today. Hey everybody, welcome to church. Good to see you all today. Are you doing good? Now, some of you are looking at me like, where's Don? Because Don's supposed to be here teaching today. So you get the B team today. You don't get the A team because she's sick. So Friday, she started, Friday night, started coming down with something, slammed her hard yesterday. Uh, yesterday. So we're trying to get her well because we leave to go with the team to Ethiopia on Tuesday. So Lord, touch her and heal her in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I'm here. So hope you're glad about that. I want to take a second and celebrate some wins. And, and the first win is life change. I love it that lives are changing here in our spiritual family. So I want you to celebrate with me those last Sunday in Fort Worth, Graham, and then those at the Freedom Retreat that were baptized, 70 people taking a step toward God in the last couple of weeks. Isn't that awesome? Just, just a huge and awesome and wonderful win. Another awesome win is we have Fort Worth Pregnancy Center here with us today. And to just give us a wave. Going to be in the lobby after services. We love you guys. We're so glad for what you do. Come on, let's give them an applause. They make a, they make a huge difference in the lives of a lot of young women. Another win is tonight is membership class. If you'll join in with us here at High Ridge, you'll make us better. That'll be a huge win. And then the last win I want to celebrate is that while Don and I are in Ethiopia, a week from today, Pastor Tim Ingram will be here. And those of you that know him, love him. He will be teaching here all services on Sunday and will be simulcasting them to Longview. So he's going to be preaching to his spiritual family here and his spiritual family there. It's going to be awesome. All right. Well, we're in a series called In the News. And uh, this series is designed to answer questions that you might have about current issues, about the condition of things in our world today. So speaking of answering questions, I have a couple of funny questions that, that uh, Dawn got for me that kids have asked their parents. Here's the first one. Mama, did Jesus practice walking on water first? Because I've been trying and it's not working. <laughs> first service laughed a little better than that. Okay, here's the next one. If Jesus doesn't have to have a sister, then why do I have to have one? <laughs> Fact is, if you read the Gospels, Jesus had some sisters. Well, last week we took a look at identity. So the whole identity politics thing going on in our world today, trying to get us to identify with something less than our identity in God. And I tried to encourage you last Sunday to recognize that your true identity is in God. That identity should mean more to you than the color of your skin, than your sexual preference, than your, than your political preference. Our real identity is in Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. And that's what I wanted to get across to you last week. Today we're going to take a look at Christianity and immigration. And just like last week's teaching had a foundation to it, which is our identity is in Christ, this week's teaching has a foundation. And the foundation this week is very simply this, obey the law. All of us and every one of us obey the law. So we're going to see that in just a moment as we dig into this. But I want to give you the, the verses that are used by those in government and, and, and quite often by well-meaning Christians to say that anyone and everyone should be able to come into our country and not have to become a citizen of our country. To say that we shouldn't have any borders. To say that there shouldn't be a wall. Let me just tell you by way of reference, you can read in Genesis, there were lots of walls. Lots of borders that are defined in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah was given an assignment by God to do what? To build a wall. Not just to keep people out, but to protect the people inside. And so we see it in scripture. It's not bad, but I want to explain to you the meaning of a word that's, that's misinterpreted and misused to try to get you to understand there's a right way and a wrong way to obey the law when you're trying to come into our country. Now, let me just say this. I love immigration. 
You should too. Unless you are here and you are a 100% pure-blooded Native American from one of the original tribes that, that were here on this, on this part of the world uh, before the settlers came, you're an immigrant too. All of us are immigrants. I love immigration. My daughter-in-law is in the process of immigrating to the United States, and I'm really glad about that. So glad that she's on her way here, but there are laws that we follow. So let me, let me give you this first passage and explain some terms, and then we'll look at a couple other scriptures as well. Leviticus 19, verse 33, the issue of immigration is dealt with straight on in the Bible, and here it is, Leviticus 19, 33. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. Now, now what would happen is, is that well-meaning people would say, not only should we not do them wrong, we should do everything for them. And that is a deception. It's not what this is saying, and it's not what we should try to do. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So many would say that this is a call to compassion, and I would agree. It is a call to compassion. It is a call to mercy in the right way. The Bible is very clear on who we're to show compassion to. We're to show compassion to persecuted Christians. We're to show compassion to the legitimate poor that as a result of difficulties cannot, cannot take themselves. We're to show compassion for widows and orphans. But we are not called from the scripture to show compassion for those who are willingly unemployed or for those who are living illegally. The scripture will never encourage us to help someone not work and the scriptures never encourage us to help someone and encourage someone and to aid and abet someone breaking the law. The Bible doesn't teach that. Compassion doesn't go to the point of being illegal. So do we show compassion? Yes, the scriptures are clear. We're to show compassion. I want to explain to you what this word stranger means. So twice, it's in verse 33 and verse 34. And the word stranger very simply is describing one who wants to convert to the laws and the language and the customs and the values of another country. And as we see it here in Leviticus, it's people that were wanting to become Israeli. They were wanting to become Hebrew people. And so the term is not correct when you just say stranger. Our translations don't capture it right. A better term would be proselyte. When the proselyte, and that just simply means the one who wants to become like. When the one who wants to become like you and be a part of your laws and be in your land and pay taxes and live the way that you live, then help them to go through the process to do so. That's what it's saying. And those of you that have been around for a while, you know I was born in, in Illinois. And I'm not ashamed of my heritage. I just, as fast as I could, got to Texas. So I wasn't born here, but I heard someone tell me when I first moved here, they said, look, you can call yourself a Texan when you live here longer than you live anywhere else. So I lived in Illinois for 21 years. I've been here for 36, 37 years. I'm a Texan now. So glad to be here. Glad you all that are native Texans accepted me. I love Illinois, but I love Texas better. You know why? Texas, we can drive 65 or 75 miles an hour. <laughs> Illinois is still driving 55. Texas, we get to go through a legal process to be able to carry a handgun. I love that. Illinois, you get locked up and you get your gun taken away. So, so I'm glad to be here, but I am honoring the laws of this land. So here are the three designations of a stranger according to what, what we see here in Leviticus 19. The first one is, is the Hebrew word Ezrach. Ezrach simply means one born in Israel. How many of y'all were born in the United States? Give me a wave. Good, you are Ezraks to the United States. You were born here, so you're a citizen here. Here's the second, Gergazak. This defines one who wasn't born here, but wants to live here. And they want to live here as a proselyte. They want, they want to come here and live here according to the laws of the land here. This would capture Tara, my daughter-in-law. And that is, that is blessed, and that, that is a very good way to understand the passage in Leviticus. And when the one who wants to come reside in your land, willing to follow the laws of your land, including the ways that they get into your land, they want to come, then help them to do so, and then once they are, then just call them a native. They're just like me now in Texas. And then the third designation, the third meaning of this word, is, is the Hebrew gerdeshav, and it means one who's illegal. 
one who wants to be present but doesn't want to abide by the laws of the lands, one who wants to be present in the blessed place, and for, for in this time it was in the Hebrew land, wants to be there, wants to take, but doesn't want to give and doesn't want to go through the legal process to get there. That, my friend, is where the issue is. That's where the issue is in our world today with almost every country around the world. People wanting to get there, but not wanting to get there to be like the ones who are there. And that's where the trouble comes in. That's why there are nations in our world that have closed their borders completely. Why? Because there have been immigrants come from countries where there's difficulty going on, civil war going on, religious war going on, but when they get into the country, they don't assimilate at all. Crime rate goes up, poverty goes up, difficulties go up, and some countries are just closing their borders. I'm not telling you that I think that's right or wrong, but I'm saying we've got an issue to deal with with immigration. But it should be for everyone wanting to come in that they would desire, like we do, to obey the law. Somebody say, obey the law. Why do we have to have laws? Why do we have to have laws? Well, the answer to that is simple. Sin. We have to have laws because people sin. Why do we have so many laws? Because people have sinned in so many ways. That's where laws come from. People doing things to other people or people doing things against property or against animals. And laws are written as a result. Did you know that when laws were first written, it was for the purpose of helping godly people stay godly? In the scripture, 613 laws written for the Hebrew people by Moses to help them to understand how to love and worship their God. And now there are thousands, if not millions of laws on planet earth. Why? Because misbehavior has to be dealt with. Romans chapter 13 gives us a really key insight on the foundation to the immigration issue. The foundation is very simply this. We see in Romans chapter 13, we're to obey the law. And we're to encourage people to obey the law. Now look, you might be sitting there thinking, good, then go Pastor Jeff, get them. Get all those people who are illegal immigrants. Well, I want to tell you, you should obey the law too. Rather than casting a judgment there, are you obeying the law? Are you paying your taxes the way you're supposed to? Are you paying your student loans the way you're supposed to? Have you been required to go to jurisdiction and to go to, to go to jurisprudence as a result of not obeying the law and our tax dollars had to pay a judge to sit there and decide how to deal with you not doing what you're supposed to do? Listen, don't throw the first stone, my friend, as someone trying to get into our country and maybe not doing it the right way if you're not willing to have your heart be right as well. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. We need a foundation of law-abiding citizens in our nation, and I'm here to call you, I'm calling myself, that we be the ones that lead the way in every aspect of our society. Not break the laws in the way that we can get away with it and then condemn someone who can't get away with it. No, all of us need to honor and obey the laws of our land. How do I know that? It's in Romans chapter 13. Here we go, look at this. Every person, somebody say every person, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are established by God. Very simply, we are to obey the laws, and we have laws on how to get into our country. Disobeying those laws is not obeying those laws. And so I, I just stand here to tell you today, we have laws, and we should be praying for those laws to be applied. Illegal immigration is against the law, just like many other things are that we need to get in line with. There's nothing in scripture that contradicts a sovereign nation having their own borders, having immigration laws, and even having walls, as I mentioned in Nehemiah. Nothing against it. Let's read on in Romans chapter 13, verse five. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. Now, I want you to see this. Why are we supposed to obey the law? Why are we? Why are we as Christians supposed to obey? This is being written to Christians, Christ followers. Why are we supposed to obey the law? Look at this. To be in subjection. Why? Not only because of wrath, because we should not want to provoke legal authorities to have to do something to us, to receive someone's wrath. But secondly, but also for conscience sake. And this should be the place where we really live. Not doing wrong because the indwelling Holy Spirit is telling us, ah, not don't. And we agree with that, and therefore our conscience 
keeps us clean before the Lord so that we don't do things to violate the laws of our land. God wants leaders in our country devoted to helping us and protecting us, and laws are required for that to happen. Let me help you see even more here. Look at verse 7. Render to all what is due them. In other words, give to the authorities what they call for. Look at this. Tax to whom taxes do. How many of y'all just love paying taxes? You just love it. You want to pay more. <laughs> me either. But how many of you love what your taxes are doing for the most part? I do. I like having a road to drive on. We're going to be in Ethiopia this, this week. I like having roads to drive on. It makes a lot better ride through the country. And that's not the case in Ethiopia. Custom, to whom custom is due. What's custom? Easiest way for us to understand would be sales tax. So we pay income tax. That would be the first reference. Custom, that'd be sales tax. In other words, we, we pay an addition according to our pleasures and our purchases. Why? Because that's necessary to help the government lead us as well. And here it is in the Bible. And then fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. So it goes from literal taxes, then it goes to the attitude of the heart, fear and honor. We're to have that for our government. We're going to pray in just a moment that that'll be the case. Because we need some help in America. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now you might be saying, no, wow, I didn't know the Bible said that kind of stuff. I want to just help you to recognize the author of what I'm reading right here is the Apostle Paul. Does anyone know where he was at the moment he was writing this? If you know, tell me. He was in prison. He was chained, ankles and wrists. He was sitting on a dirt floor next to where there was a hole dug in the floor where he was able to perform his necessities. He was not in a blessed place. There was threat of death on his life. He's not in a place that any of us would want to have been in at that point. And what is he telling the people in Rome to do? Obey the law. Honor the authorities. Pay your taxes. And I'm here to tell you, my friend, we have not had a leader in our land nearly as wicked as the leader who was leading in Rome at this time. Nero put Christians on stakes and lit their bodies on fire to be torches for the roads in the city of Rome. That is some wicked living. If there would ever be a time where a spiritual leader would say, break the law because the leader is wicked, that would have been the time. And that's not what the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said, in spite of all that, obey the law. Honor authorities. Do what you can. Are the immigration laws in the United States fair? Are they just? I don't know completely. I don't know enough to speak to it. Is there room for reform? There probably is. Laws change. Growing up in Illinois, I remember when my basketball coach was hired from Wisconsin. And he wanted to have the first practice in the history of my high school, basketball practice on a Sunday. And the whole community erupted. They were after Coach Binger. He came from Wisconsin and he said, I didn't think Illinois was as backwards as Wisconsin. I thought we could practice on Sunday. And he said, they just repealed the law that it's illegal to carry a gallon of milk on a public street in Wisconsin. Why can't you all catch up in Illinois and let us practice basketball on Sunday? Would you all agree that that's a pretty old law that might need to be reformed, that it's against the law to carry a gallon of milk down the street in Wisconsin on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day? I would think it's okay to repeal that law, but that doesn't give us an excuse to break them. Are all of our tax laws exactly the way we'd like it? There are many business owners in this room that would say, tax laws are killing me. That doesn't justify you breaking those. The Holy Spirit within you is not telling you to do that. It's telling us to honor the law. And that needs to be the foundation for immigration. Honor the law. Do what the law requires. If you, if you are here illegally, I just want to tell you I love you. You're heading toward a great place, but do it right. Do it according to the law. If you know someone that's here illegally, help them to get in the process to do it right. Because when you honor the authorities that God has allowed to be in place, then God honors you. And he will help you in that process. Illegal immigration is a complex issue. But doing something good, like illegally coming to the country to provide for your family, et cetera, is not necessarily best. Let me describe to you. Doing something good that's not best. So when Don was 50, so eight years ago, we were on family vacation on Possum Kingdom Lake. 
I just told her age. That's terrible. I'm sorry. Oh, well. She looks like she's 20, though, doesn't she? There, there we go. Honey, when you watch this, remember I said that. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vacation on Possum Kingdom Lake. And we were on a boat, and we were on the lake driving, and she was sitting in one of the two front seats, and I was driving, and there was a weird wave. Have you ever been on a lake and saw a weird wave? You think, where'd that wave come from, and how come it looks so gnarly? And so, like any good boat driver do, you, you take an angle to go across the wave, and I did, and for some reason, it, it hit the bottom of the boat funny, and it launched her off the seat up into the air, hands and feet up like she was doing a V-sit, and she landed in the bottom of the boat right on her patuchka right there on her coccyx, which is not a cuss word, <laughs> tailbone, and multiple spiral fractures immediately. She was in pain. She, she started shivering. Shock was hitting her immediately because the pain was so intense. Wheeled the boat around, back to the boat ramp, unloaded her, grabbed her, told the kids, go get the pillows off the sofas in the cabin. We padded the back of the Suburban, laid her up in the back of the Suburban. Uh, uh, Bree rode with her. And I did not drive the speed limit from there to the hospital. I broke the law. And I'm not telling you it was a good thing. I did it. I really broke the law. I drove really fast. I drove really, really fast. Because she was crying and hurting and I wanted to get her to the hospital. And so I was doing that. In my mind, I'm thinking the whole time, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, please, please. No state troopers here on this highway, please, Lord. Please. But then I was thinking, okay, what are you going to do, Jeff? You're breaking the law. And the reason why you're breaking it, you've justified to be a good thing. You want to try to help your wife. And the Holy Spirit said, well, then you would need to honor the law. If you get caught, you got to stop. So I thought, okay, if I get caught and I got to stop, what do I do? So I'll just throw the doors open, hands up, I'll run back. Please, 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 she's hurting. Then I realized that'd be stupid to do. That'd be totally stupid. Just sit there, window down. And as soon as the officer came up, I would say, please help me get her to the hospital. She's about, she's been passing out, and I don't know how much more she can stand the pain. But I'm not telling you that what I did was the best thing to do. It wasn't. I was driving really fast. Thank the Lord that, that angels were helping us. I'm not telling you that was right. I'm not going to tell you that it was good. I broke the law. In my mind, I was doing it because of something good. But nevertheless, I broke the law. And I'm encouraging you to encourage yourself or people you know, if they're breaking the law and getting into this country, encourage them to honor the law and to not justify it as being a good thing. Because breaking the law is never a good thing. Somebody in law enforcement, say amen. God wants to help us to help people and to bless people, but to do so the right way. How many of y'all remember the blue law? Better remember the blue law? So those that are younger, you might not remember or might not even know that Texas had a law at one time that there was no retail sales or restaurant sales on Sunday. It was the Sabbath. It was the Lord's Day. And there was nothing open. Uh, gas stations were open, but no, no place to buy clothes or to buy food. And it was, quote, unquote, the blue law because it made all the moms blue that they didn't get to eat out that day. And, uh, man, it was, it was tough. And I remember when the blue law was lifted. Glory, hallelujah. Real mambo every day after church. <laughs> Don was so happy. But before that, it was a law. Before that, it was a law, and it was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for us on Sunday after church. But after that, the law was lifted, and then it was eaten out. It was enjoying the blessings that had come. As long as the law is in place, obey the law. Somebody say amen. Amen. As long as the law is in place, obey the law. Regardless of your convictions, regardless of your situations, choose to obey the law in all aspects of your life and choose to encourage the people around your life to obey the law. We have no hope if we have no laws. Not every person in America is a spirit-filled Christian. Therefore, we've got to have laws. We have no hope. We have no country if we don't have laws. Laws aren't bad. They're given by authorities to keep us out of sin. Obey the law. One more passage of Scripture. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 2. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or as to one in authority. Listen, I just want to help you understand this. The number one responsibility of our elected leaders is to protect us. 
Number one responsibility of our elected leaders is to protect us. Or to govern as sent by him for one of punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Somebody say, if I'll do right, it'll silence the lies. As free men, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Now look at this. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Love, love the Christians. Fear God. And look at the last one. This is Peter. Honor the king. Obey the laws of the land. Obey the laws of the land. Follow the laws of that land. Why? Because God has placed them there for a reason. So will you agree with me that we love everyone? Come on, can somebody say we're going to love everybody? Love everybody, whether they're doing right or not, we're going to try to love them. But here's a more important thing. Will you join me in praying for America? That was weak. Can a few more of you say yes? yes. Tuesday was National Day of Prayer. Kelly, would you go ahead and make your way up here, please? One of our elders is going to join me and we're going to pray. National Day of Prayer came as a result of Dr. Billy Graham greatest evangelist of the modern era, calling our nation to pray. Saw a picture of the first one on the White House steps many years ago. I don't remember the date. I want to say it was in the 50s, but of all the government officials and people just on their knees praying, calling out to Almighty God. I love the National Day of Prayer. I'd like for us to do that right now. If you can, would you join me? And would you just come to your knees and just humble yourself before the Lord as we call out to God to heal our land and to help our leaders? If you can, would you just join me in submitting yourself before the Lord and humbling yourself before the Lord? Because the best thing we can do is to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. Yes. We thank you that we have the right to assemble and to worship and to yes. praise you, Lord, because we do live in a free country. Lord, we don't take these freedoms lightly. Yes. We're very, very thankful for them. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifices of our forefathers that we did allow you to make this a shining city on a hill. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices of our military. Yes. Bless them. Each and every one. We thank you, Lord, for the protection from our government. We thank you, Lord, for the services they provide for us. We thank you, Lord, for, for the men and women that, that dedicate their lives in service to us, yes, in the Senate, in the Congress, and President, and Vice President, and staffers. We thank you, Lord, for our local government. Yes. We thank you for our mayor, our city councilmen. We thank you for our, our state governments, senators and congressmen, and women as well, too, Lord. But more than anything, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that above all, Lord, that we have the opportunity to honor them. Yes. That we can lead, Lord, not follow. That we can show the world, Lord, that by honoring and doing things your way, that it does work. We don't have to fight and fight and fight and fight and call each other, Lord. And right, right now, Lord, we just speak right now, Lord, for any division. Yes. Heal our land, Lord. Yes, Lord. No more racial division. Yes, yes. No more Lord. political division, Lord. Yes, we just Lord. We, we call forth, Lord. It says in your word that we can have what we ask for, Lord. We ask for peace yes, Lord, for our countries. Right. We seek you, Lord, that you will provide peace for us, Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that once again we can be a truly a Judeo Christian nation as you formed us. Yes, Lord. Lord, we call forth blessings across our land, Lord. Yes, Lord. We call forth great things happening. We thank you, Lord, for putting, speaking to our leaders. Yes, Lord. That by, by, by hearing your voice, Lord, I said, surround them, Lord. Put, put laborers across their path that they can hear exactly what it is that you want to do with our yes, land. Lord. Lord, and I, and I want to call forth us, too, to get involved. We, can't, we won't be the silent majority on the, on the sidelines any longer. That we would, Lord, I know there's people in this room today, Lord, that you want to rise up, that you want to put them yes. forward, Lord. Yes. Let them be someone who can actually lead. I ask, Lord, you put it in their heart, Lord. Let them get in involved, Lord. Ask him to come see Pastor Jeff and tell him. He knows who to connect him to, Lord. They make things happen, Lord. We give you the honor and the glory yes, and the Lord. praise, Lord. As we honor up, Lord, that you'll honor that as well, too. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to President Trump. Yes, help him. Help him, Lord. Help him, Lord. Double dose help him, Lord. 
Double dose helps Nancy Pelosi. Double dose hand, hand Mitch McConnell, Lord. All the way through, Lord, I ask that you heal them. You, that, that, that you let them hear what you have to yes, say, what Lord. you want to do. That your heart's desire would happen, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not ours, but yours, Lord. And we honor you for that in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen.